And that's what worries me, because as we know, actions uh, are more important than words. And he, he has flipped that uh, dynamic. And, and what would happen to Israel if they don't meet, uh, defeat Hamas after seven months of this war, if, if in the end Hamas isn't completely eradicated? Well, the, the, my view is, and I think it's a view that a lot of uh, Israeli politicians and others feel, a lot of the Israeli public feel, is that you cannot destroy 80% of Hamas. You cannot leave them in, you cannot take them out of Gaza City, and you cannot take them out of a set of other uh, uh, towns and so on, and leave them intact in Rafa. And Rafa is reckoned to be not just where the remaining Israeli hostages are held, uh, hostages who the rest of the world seems to have forgotten about, but the Israeli people quite rightly haven't. Um, and there's no point in leaving that there and leaving the leaving those people there and leaving the heads of Hamas, including, it seems, Sinwar, the mastermind of the seventh, in Rafa. Mm. All it means is like putting out 80 percent of the fire that you will that the Israelis will with, withdraw from Gaza and Hamas will grow back, will continue to subjugate the Palestinian population in Gaza, will continue to enrich themselves and will prepare for the next attack against Israel. And my prediction is that these, you know, every other year wars that Hamas has been provoking since it took control of the Gaza uh, would just go on in that scenario. I think it is much better for the Israeli public and indeed for the Palestinian public in Gaza that Hamas are done for, that it's over and that other partners in the region can help in whatever way they can to rebuild the society there. It is not going to be an easy job, but it will be infinitely harder if Hamas still have any kind of a stronghold. So preventing Israeli victory, once again, would lead only to another set of cycles of conflict. And I don't think that's desirable. No, it's not desirable for either party, as, as you explained. Uh, one thing we have seen in Israel, though, is the willingness of its people to fight for their country. Young people are willing to risk their lives to defend their country. That's not a sentiment that is shared in, in the West. In the UK, only a quarter of young people, 27%, said they were willing to be enlisted to defend their country. And uh, one doesn't, uh, I guess... Douglas seek to protect what one doesn't value. And there's certainly a deep sense of self-loathing among many young people for their own country, whether we're talking about the UK, the US or right here in Australia. What can be yeah. done to combat that? I feel that's such a destructive force with all sorts of long-term uh, dangers. Well, it has huge long-term dangers. And I, I mean, I spoke a bit about this a bit when I was in Australia recently. But I mean, you, you, the recent referendum in Australia was a very, very important blow uh, to the people who would like mm. to make all people in Western democracies, only in Western democracies, feel utterly wretched about everything about us, to make everybody in the majority feel that we're usurpers and colonizers and genocidists and all of these other outrageous claims, always claims made against the most free and the most fair societies on earth. But this has been done for more than a generation now. You tell young Australians that they have no right to the land. You tell young Americans that they're they're just there because they usurped the native peoples. You tell Europeans, even when they are the native peoples, that although they are the native peoples, they should be themselves usurped. Go on and on like that. And of course, of course, you're going to have a lot of young people who think, um, well, why on earth would I risk my life for a country I've been told is rotten from the beginning? I think we need to turn this whole thing around, and I think it can be turned around. The young Israelis have shown it can be turned around. They, they've shown that uh, when it really comes to brutal reality in your face, you can stand up and fight. And the young Israelis have, uh, I hope that it never comes to that for young Australians and Americans and Canadians and British and Europeans. Uh, uh, but if it did, that we would be tested. And I think a lot of people would fail that test because they've been taught to fail that test. They have, and we've uh, had this poison in academia and elsewhere for, for, for decades. So I'm glad you, you believe it can be turned around. I do have my doubts. Now, before you go, I've got to ask you about this uh, ongoing sham trial of former President Donald Trump. It's continuing in Manhattan. We've had Stormy Daniels testify. Uh, 
Much of her testimony, salacious details that are completely relevant to the case. We've had serial perjurer Michael Cohen on the stand and it seems everyone is resigned to the fact that this is some sort of a show trial. It's a political case as much as anything. Uh, former federal prosecutor Andrew C. McCarthy uh, wrote in the New York Post that New Yorkers should be outraged at the mockery District Attorney Alvin Bragg is making of the state's legal system as the entire country looks on. Douglas, the entire country is looking on. But whatever the Democrats are trying to achieve here seems to be backfiring because the polls are pretty clear. Trump is increasing his lead, particularly in those crucial swing states. Yeah, I, it's an extraordinary miscalculation uh, by uh, Democrat prosecutors and others. Um, as you say, as these trials go on, Trump's lead seems to strengthen. Might, some people outside America might mm. wonder why that is, and I think it's got a, it's, it's 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 a couple of things. One is a lot of Americans have had themselves have had bad experiences with the justice system, and so the idea that the justice system can be in some way rigged is is a claim that they're sort of open to in a way that I think in Australia and Britain we we, we sort of wouldn't be. But the second is that you see people like D. A. Bragg effectively uh, uh, putting on a trial in search of a crime. Um, and and that's, yeah. what this, th that's what this trial has been. It's a trial in search of a crime. And uh, Stormy Daniels took the stand, not because she had anything uh, new to say, although she did actually contradict previous testimony she'd given, but because, of course, it was yeah. meant to humiliate Donald Trump. There were salacious details. And, you know, frankly, I mean, most people would be humiliated to hear even these allegations made against him or against themselves. Mm. Uh, Trump, as ever, amazingly, sort of has this ability to, to, to brush it off. If I were the Democrats and others, I would start to be worrying about this whole tactic, this whole tactic of let's take him out by judicial means. Uh, um, there's all sorts of criticisms that can be made in every direction here. But the ultimate issue in America is the people. The people get to decide. They get to decide who to vote for and eventually who they do vote for. That's uh, not up to, to, to D.A. Bragg. Uh, it's not up to anyone else. It's up to the American public. And uh, they may yet surprise the world. Well, I think that's what the Democrats are scared of. They don't want the American public to decide. And I think they were counting on a criminal conviction sealing the deal, yeah. but I don't think even if that eventuates, it's going to make a difference. Uh, Douglas Murray, thank you so much for your time this evening. Great pleasure as always. Thank you.